Hey guys, I'm Janet on occasion, and today, uh, hi, hello, you can see me, uh, because uh, it's just gonna be a talking head video, I'm just gonna be chatting, so I thought I may as well be here. Uh, also, I get to sort of figure out my setup a bit. Uh, I've changed my studio around, I'm on a new desk, and uh, I've, everything's on stands and stuff, and I'm using equipment I couldn't really use very easily before, um, because of space and the desk and stuff, so, I, you know, I've refreshed everything around. I was hoping to get done weeks ago. But you know what life is like. So anyway, uh, yeah, so I thought I'd test it out here. But uh, basically, we're not going to be doing a campaign today. Because I'm really fed up of starting campaigns and not being able to actually do more than an episode. I mean, I can, but like, you know, stopping after three episodes would be even worse, <laughs> you know? Uh, so yeah, instead of that, I thought uh, we'd focus on something a bit different. Um, because again, I don't really like doing little article pieces. I like just engrossing myself in a story. It's been, it's been annoying. Uh, I'll say that much. It's been annoying how we do this sort of content, but this sort of content is better. So here, what I'm going to be doing is there's a new uh, unit in Spell Browser. So if I back out of this for a second, this is the end of the campaign that, you know, I did the preview, you know, the little campaign preview for Cathay the other day for Miao Yin. And uh, see up here behind development in progress, I know it, it'll be easier to spot <laughs> when it's not in progress. The development, I mean. Uh, so, unit and spell browser. And, yeah, so you've got the spell browser, like we've had in the past. And uh, I do need to ask if I can look at all of this. Because, obviously, there's, uh, like, Lord of the Great Moor and um, uh, Lord of Tempest and Ice. And uh, we haven't been able to play Kislev or uh, all the Ogre Kingdoms yet. Oh, and, like, Lord of Slanesh and Zinch as well. Like we have, oh, and Nurgle. And, yeah, we haven't been able to play these, these factions. So, I don't know if that's something I can show you yet. But I'm going to find out, and we can go through all the new spells. Um, just in one video, which I think is way easier, you know? Um, I know Cataclysm ones are fine, but yeah, the others. So we'll go through that. But as well as the Spell Browser, they've now made the encyclopedia, instead of it loading a web page. Uh, it's all encompassing, you know, it's all encompassed in this one thing. Which I think is great, I think it's fantastic. So here, I thought we'd take the time to talk about Grand Cathay. Because, you know, we haven't been able to ever because they've not existed <laughs> so you know a lot of this stuff is completely new um or at least you know revised or whatever it's it's a new thing so uh also select race we can look at all of them and what's great is even in the base game you could look at bretonia and dwarfs and high elves i mean bretonia as far as i'm aware don't exist in warhammer 3 they're not in the campaign map in any any capacity i don't know if like there's there's the odd random unit you can get like via an event or something like because you can get like a high elf noble from a random event um i think dark elves might be at a quest battle somewhere but like you know most a lot of this stuff doesn't necessarily exist and if it does it's certainly in like a little niche way so the idea of being able to even go okay look let's watch let's let's have a look at tomb kings let's look at all the tomb king units let's learn all about them and you could do that and look at this huge huge amount of text uh, on some of these guys, which is really amazing. So the fact that it's all here in this little um, UI, I think is wonderful. It's such a beautiful addition, uh, which I think is great. You know, just baked into the game, um, such as it is, I think is wonderful. So, we're going to talk about Cathay. I know, we've only been going for three minutes and I haven't done anything. Oh, also, I've got a little mascot now. <laughs> yeah, it was while I was sorting out everything, uh, going through cupboards and stuff and just trying to, you know, find a place for things I was no longer using and also digging out the things I can now use having, you know, upturned my studio but yeah, I found this little guy I don't have a name for him yet, so let me know maybe I'll put it to a poll in the community tab or something but yeah, we got this little guy yeah, anyway admin out of the way, should we actually do some content? probably you know, I want this to be chill I want everyone to make sure that on this channel we don't do things quickly <sighs> lovely so, blood dragon Blood dragon? Dragon blooded? We don't do things quickly. Dragon blooded? That is actually. Blood, blood, dragged is probably the best I've done. Um, in the past, I've said I've said all kinds of things like uh, um, blood draggled and all sorts. Like, for some reason, I can't say dragon blooded without, like, serious effort. So, enjoy the next half an hour. So, dragon blooded Shugengen. Lord of Yang. So, Celestial Blood grants both unassailable authority and rare mastery of the elemental winds. Over the centuries, the Celestial Dragon's nine dragon children have themselves had children, born of mortal men and women. Those mortal offspring of the dragons are known as the Dragon Blooded. Nailed it. 
uh, in time, these mortal children have themselves become the progenitors of entire dynasties. They're people able to trace their ancestry back to the uh, celestial dragon emperor himself. While the dragon-blooded remain relatively rare, there are still many thousands of them in Cathay. Given their lineage and the power that comes with it, the dragon-blooded typically rise to positions of authority as important rulers or magistrates in the lands controlled by their forefathers and mothers. Interesting stuff. So, this is specifically talking about the dragon-blooded. Yes. Uh, but not the Shigungan part of it, okay? The Shigungan thing is um, separate, but luckily there's a second lord that we can look at. So we have Yang and Yin to look at. So for Yin, powerful sorcerers, second only to the dragons themselves. Shugangan can bend the eight winds to their whim. Zzz. The dragon-blooded are natural sorcerers, and many take uh, take to mastery of the elemental winds as easily as wielding a blade or crossbow. The most powerful of them are known as the Shugangan an elite arm of the Celestial Court that stands equal to, but apart from, the Astromancers. The Shigangan practice their own form of high magic focused on the Yang or Yin branches of the Elemental Winds, known as Feng Shi, and can conjure the most powerful magics known to the Empire. Only the dragons themselves are able to command the Elemental Winds more skillfully. So, there's the Shigangan part of it, but what exactly is Shigangan? So, um, it's it's a bit weird, isn't it? Does it just mean sorcerer? No, no. Uh, and I'll show you for why. Uh, in a second. Where are you? Hang on. Uh, here we go. Done. <laughs> Shigendo. Shigendo. This is where it comes from. I'd assume. Because, uh, of the fact that it's Shigendo and it seems really relevant. So, Shigendo... The way of trial and practice, um, the way of Shugen or Gen practice, apparently. Hopefully that all made sense, but anyway. Uh, is a highly syncretic religion, a body of ascetic practices that originates in uh, Heian, I don't know, something, era Japan, having evolved during the 7th century from the amalgamation of beliefs, philosophies, doctrines, and ritual systems drawn from local folk religious practices. Shinto, mountain worship, and Buddhism. The final purpose of Shigendo is for practitioners to find supernatural power and save themselves and the masses by conducting religious training while treading through steep mountain ranges. Practitioners are called Shugenja, uh, or Yamabushi, literally mountain prostrator. The mountains uh, where Shugenja practiced were all over Japan and include various mountains of the uh, Omine, uh, mountain range such as Mount Hakyo and Mount Omine. So you might be saying, uh, Janet, uh, that's Japan, because that is China. Like I said, just inspired from, but uh, a lot of the ancient sort of practices of both China and Japan overlap quite a bit, um, and Korea as well, a whole area. Um, certainly when it comes to like things associated with religion, uh, there's a lot of a lot of transference there, supposedly supposedly there is you know i'm not an authority on this stuff but uh shugendo seems uh perfect for this so uh yeah the, the idea of you know finding supernatural powers things like that the idea of it being associated with like an amalgamation of philosophies doctrines and all the rest of it uh they're learning the eight winds of magic and they're learning about harmony and you know yin and yang it's 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 everything together which um is the impression that i get so it, to me that seems appropriate for what it is um i haven't been able to find a more convincing you know thing of what shugengen means uh so if anyone has any ideas then let me know but this feels super appropriate like you know, it seems to match perfectly. Uh, there's also history and uh, practices here. So practices are where things get interesting as well. According to uh, Hiyaki uh, Mitoshi, Shigendo rituals include festivals, fortune telling, divination, prayers and incantations, exorcism, spells, charms, and so forth. It's pretty broad. And so the idea of just general mysticism, um, you know, any and all, I think it makes a lot of sense. The idea of someone who's just, you know, at face value just like oh that that's a magic dragon blooded person fine they're basically magic just intrinsically magic all regards you know i think it fits quite well so that's that's my you know that's my theory right then hey there 
back to this unit spell browser, we've talked about one unit. <laughs> Technically two, actually, because it's the two different lords, two different <laughs> different spells. Other than that, they're basically the same. But anyway, whatever, it's fine. So next up, we have the Lord Magistrate. So a master strategist requires unquestioning allegiance from the vast armies of their great city. So the magistrates, of course, you know, magistrate of each city. Um, so each of the great cities of Grand Cathay is governed by a Lord Magistrate in the name of the Dragon Emperor. These are canny men and women, as adept at navigating the politics of the Empire as they are directing troops in battle. As skilled strategists, Lord Magistrates can often dictate the pace of battle even before it begins, catching their enemies flat-footed with the rapid mobilization of their troops. Lord Magistrates lead from the back of the army, using fans, banners, and coloured smoke to orchestrate many units of their army. So I really love the dynamic here for Cathay in the fact that the magistrates are basically just like uh, the the I mean they're just the lords of the of the castle, right? But they don't want to be in the thick of combat. No, 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 no. They're there to make sure that the <laughs> disposable <laughs> peasants go going and do their job, um, basically. But they're they're great strategists, right? So it's you know you can, I'm sure you guys have all seen these sort of very um, sort of archetypal you know, lords and ladies playing chess and, you know, playing these strategy games. Think like Tao Tao and things like that. Um, you know, these master strategists, and that's where they learn, you know, Sun Tzu, that, that whole archetype of person. That's what the magistrates are. You know, they're not like, uh, you know, they're not like, um, I don't know, Liu Bei or something, you know, running into combat, Zhang Fei. You know, they're not like these people running into combat like that and being heroes. They're like, no, they're just going to be more canny. And I think that's really cool, especially in the confines of this game, where generally you've got the melee lord and the spellcaster lord. But actually, the melee lord is only a melee lord because they don't have magic, <laughs> not because they're good at it. They're the support lord. They're there to make sure all the other troops are doing really well, which I think is really interesting because that we haven't really had that in Warhammer before. That's not really been a thing. So I think that's a really interesting one, just from a gameplay perspective. Uh, but also it makes perfect sense for the, that sort of culture. I think it's really cool. So next up, we have Zhao Min, the Iron Dragon. So though the Iron Dragon possesses untold authority, decades of warpstone experimentation have taken a toll upon his mind. So this, I think, is interesting, the fact that it's framed as being that's what's happened, like all the warpstone has gone mad. Uh, it makes me wonder what bias there is in this flavor text, because there's always a bias. There's always a bias with writing about Warhammer and stuff in Warhammer. There is always a bias. And uh, this to me seems like uh, what the what Grand Cathay think about this guy rather than what other people think about this guy. Because the lore that we've read already in all the blog posts talking about Cathay basically had it that, yeah, maybe maybe the Warpstones had a bit of an effect on him. But the only reason people think that that's the case is because he's kind to humans. That's why. You know, that's why they think he's gone mad, because he'll share a drink, you know, with his colleagues who are researching, you know, these different um, metallurgical, you know, wonders, um, you know, in his forges and whatnot. Like, all that magic is, is, yeah, and he uses Warpstone to do that, sure, but he treats humans as people instead of sort of whatever, possessions, basically. Um, and so that's why people think he's mad. So... It makes me wonder, it makes me wonder um, how that plays into the sort of any narrative that the game is trying to create revolving around these characters. You know, I'd be interested to have that explored more, but anyway. So a hardened frontier warrior, the Iron Dragon maintains the western edge of the Empire and keeps the desert clans in order. A skillful alchemist, he uses the strange minerals of the Warpstone Desert to create unique weapons for his armies. Cabals of metal and fire wizards are welcomed within his realm, much to the irritation of the Jade Dragon, who sees the uh, encouragement of sorcerous organizations outside the Celestial Court as dangerous to the Empire. These sorcerers help the Iron Dragon in his experiments, and many magical weapons and armors are therefore forged in the dragon cities. So, you know, very industrious guy, which I think is, well, uh, I mean, at first glance you think, okay, so he's the sort of, the one representing sort of industriousness. But actually, we'll see that his sister does too. <laughs> It's kind of interesting. Um, I guess just Cathay is very industrious, but there's some things that seem a bit weird. We'll get to it. Because um, I, I really can't wait to get like a proper book, you know, like an RPG supplement on Cafe would be my dream right now. But we can piece things together, I'm sure. So, that is um, Xiaomin, and now Miao Ying. 
favoured child of the Celestial Emperor, revered defender of the Great Bastion and Imperious Majesty Incarnate. So, uh, yeah, staunch imperialist and, um, yeah, favoured child. So, uh, a bit spoilt, but hardworking. I feel like she's got uh, eldest uh, sibling syndrome. Uh, certainly from, from this and everything we've read about her in, you know, the, the blogs as well. That is absolutely my impression of her. Um, just deeply authoritarian and just maintaining her inheritance. That's the impression I get. So, the Storm Dragon rules over Northern Cathay and commands the armies of the Great Bastion, cold and aloof. She has held this position for centuries. After its defence was entrusted to her by the Celestial Dragon, despite her power, the Storm Dragon has a significant task in the defence of the North, and her armies are almost constantly at war. Her vaulted position also means her father entrusts her with important tasks, some of which can put her at odds with her siblings. So if I was, uh, if this was like a Studio Mir production or something, um, then I would see, uh, I would see her well-meaning brother would be the one who eventually his experiments would get the better of him, and he would, he would turn to possibly Chaos Worship for the, for the, um, you know, Tzinch particularly, in order to get the knowledge he needs to save his people because he cares so much about them. So well-meaning, but blind to, um, you know, this wider threat. Whereas I see his sister as being cold and aloof, right? Just horrible, like, just, just, just cruel, just mean and aggressive and cared not for people. And then it would turn out, actually, that was just a front because the responsibilities that she's had sort of thrusted upon her. And then she'd loosen up and maybe, you know, realize, oh, people, people are great after all. You know, that's that's if I was writing for Studio Mir's production of this, which doesn't exist, but should. Yeah, that good. They did Avatar, by the way. Last Airbender, not the blue one, the blue people thing, you know, anyway. So that'd be that'd be my thing. So they'd swap roles. Like in season three. Yeah. Anyway, next up we have an alchemist. So, once outcasts for dabbling in forbidden elements, now prized for their fearsome mastery of metal and fire. Outcast elemental wizards often gravitate towards Shangyang and the West. Shangyang is the uh, the province that uh, 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 Zhao Min looks after, the brother. Um, here they have formed their own shadow celestial court known as the House of Secrets. In the House of Secrets, all kinds of magics are practiced, though, uh, practiced, though the alchemists of Shanyang are especially well known, using the rare elements of the Warpstone Desert to create powerful elixirs, metals, and potions. Favoured by the Iron Dragon, the alchemists have steadily gained power and acceptance over the centuries, and generals and magistrates will sometimes secure their services in battle, where their sorcery can enchant the weapons of their soldiers. Very cool. Very cool indeed. But can you see, like, they're striving for... You know, just to just to keep pushing the the sort of the limits of science. You know, you could totally see them accidentally doing a chaos. <laughs> so, you know, who knows? Um, but and then, of course, we have the astromancers that are the more revered ones, the the ones who are very much sanctioned by you know, the Celestial Dragon Emperor. So favoured wizard of the Emperor himself, granted knowledge of celestial sorcery, perfected across millennia. Of all of the magical disciplines, the most well-established is that of the Astromancers. These are the favoured wizards of the Celestial Emperor and who practice Heaven's magic. Unlike the Magisters of the Celestial Order in the Empire of the Old World, Astromancers have been perfecting their art for over 5,000 years. The Celestial Dragon himself is said to have taught man the true secrets of Azir, and their spells are far more complex and powerful as a result. So you might think, oh, but there's just a Heaven's caster, right? They have this ability. Mastery of elemental winds. So when two or more units in the same army share this attribute, intensity increases the power of spells cast. So they're able to feed off each other in order to cast more powerful spells. So spell mastery only affects like damaging spells and like healing spells, stuff with like a static amount. Like it does X amount of damage, does X amount of healing. Um, X amount of buffing stats, no. No, no, no. Just healing or damage. Um, but it's a percentage bonus to those things. So literally you're just doing more damage with the spell or you're doing more healing with the spell. Depends on the spell, you know. Depends on the spell. But really cool. I think it's a really interesting um, idea uh, just to have this. The fact that you kind of have more reason to have more than one spellcaster, even though they're having to share winds of magic. Because usually that's a massive downside, you know. I know stuff like, Ar you know, Arcane Conduit exists and all the rest of it. But even like low-level spellcasters will be able to get the most out of their spells, even if just one of them gets to do more damage, you know what I mean? 
So I really like it. I think it's really nice. Um, because, yeah, just one spellcaster on his own, you can have a billion magic items. He can still, you know, clean house. It doesn't really matter. But, yeah, for low-level spellcasters, to be able to team up, I think is a really interesting, unique uh, sort of hook for these guys. And also, it does extend to other units besides other spellcasters. Technically, kind of. You'll see. So, anyway, there's that. Now, let's talk about infantry. Okay, we're going to start with all the peasants. Actually, not going to start with infantry. We're going to start with peasants. And we happen to be looking at infantry first. So, warriors of wind and field. United in harmony, their bristling spears keeping the dragon emperor's foes at bay. The armies of Grand Cathay are vast, and if there is one thing the dragon emperor does not want for, it is men and women to fill their ranks. Hang on. The armies of Grand Cathay are vast, and if there is one thing the Dragon Emperor does not want- Oh, does not want for. He's saying that there's already so many men and women in the ranks. Okay, that's what he's saying. I think. It just seems oddly worded. It sounds like he's going, Don't want men and women in the ranks? Don't want that. No, we'll fill it with sheep. <laughs> Cattle. I don't know. Uh, so, despite their discipline, professional soldiers like the Jade Warriors of the Great Cities do not flinch when a peasant formation breaks. Because that's true. They're expendable. Expendable just means that if they break, there's no leadership penalties to nearby units, except other expendable units. Um, so other peasants are going, oh, peasants are running. Everyone else just go, peasants are running. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, so, for such is the purposes of such units, to slow the enemy until they can be dealt with by more skilled fighters. Cathayan infantry often use long spears in dense infantry formations, allowing them to impale charging enemies on the forest, uh, on a forest of blades. Now again, this is uh, reflected. Uh, <laughs> reflected. Yeah, oh, that's funny, and you don't know why yet. It's because of charge reflection. Yeah. So charge reflection is really good. Um, it's new. You know, it's new for Total War Warhammer 3. Um, well, it's been in other Total Wars, but it's new to Warhammer in Total War Warhammer 3. So basically, when bracing, they'll reflect damage. So something will charge into the spears, and they will hurt for it. So even basic units like Peasant Long Spearmen, if you have them in, like, you know, like, I don't know, sort of uh, city streets, just blocking a street, the enemy will take a minimum amount of damage from running into their spears. And that's really clever, you know? That's really good, because it makes perfect sense. It doesn't matter who's holding a spear. If you're running into spears, you're going to get hurt, you know? So I think that's really fun. I think that's really good. Um, really cool to see, you know, uh, usefulness from, like, cheap, crappy units. Have them in the front, do minimum amount of damage, and then you've got your better units behind, you know, ready to follow up and, and sort of damage, uh, you know, to finish off, like, an injured unit. I think it's really cool. So anyway... Next up, peasant archers. Though they are but humble villagers, the moon dragon herself guides their aim. Because, of course, if we have a look down here, these are yin units. All the ranged units are yin. All the melee units are yang. So, um, that's that. And and yang is the, the celestial dragon's thing, and uh, the dragon emperor's thing, and the, the moon emperor's uh, yin is her thing. So, she favours the ranged units. So anyway, though they are but humble villagers, the moon dragon herself guides their aim. In Grand Cathay, archery and the use of missile weapons is traditionally the domain of women. Though men can, and do, make up some of the Empire's missile troops, most notably those who wield the gunpowder weapons of the Great Bastion. The majority of archers and crossbowmen, uh, crossbow troops, are female. This is the work of the moon dragon, uh, Kwai Yin, herself an exceptional archer who has for centuries encouraged girls across Cathay to master the art of bow and crossbow, as well as blessing their efforts with her magic. Now, as well as this just being, like, good representation in Warhammer, which is, you know, kind of needed, because, uh, I mean, you go back to the 90s, the only women were like, you know, I'm a powerful sorceress, also wearing a bikini. Come on, guys. Come on. You can do better. And have. So, uh, this is way better. And I love the the fact that it's harmony, right? Yin and yang. And and male and female. It's all these opposites and improposites, you know, uh, in play here. So, of course, you've got most of the, the archers are women and most of the melee troops are men. And, you know, you can't have any any of these people who are, who are you know, uh, just <laughs> forever online going, you know, Oh, but... Men are stronger, so they would swing a sword better. I don't, who cares, okay? Shut up. This should keep everyone happy. It only keeps me happy. I think it's great. I think it's really cool. It makes perfect sense, you know? So, uh, anyway, the majority of archers and crossbow troops are female. blah de blah de blah And uh, herself an exceptional archer for centuries. Uh, encouraged girls across Cathay to... Oh, I actually did read all of it. I thought I'd stopped halfway through. But no, as well as blessing the efforts with their magic. So, that's all great. 
And we have one more peasant unit, which is peasant horsemen. Stoic Cathayan cavalry, as expendable as they are dutiful. Uh, the Celestial Emperor thanks them for their sacrifice. The armies of Grand Cathay are vast, and if there is one thing the Dragon Emperor does not want for, it is men and women to fill their ranks. This is uh, sounding familiar, isn't it? Okay, the start of this paragraph might be the same as a different paragraph, but it is a different unit, as we'll see, because it's about to say horsemen. Horsemen are a common sight in the provinces, the horse being as prolific a beast of burden and transport as it is in the Old World. Cathayan generals use these highly mobile troops primarily as scouts, though they can also be used to lure away enemy troops or draw them into ambushes. Oh, good to know. Good to know. Next up, we have Jade Warriors. Yes, Jade Warriors. Yeah, yeah, we've done all the peasants. Good. Jade Warriors, finding harmony in stone and steel, their minds are disordered as they're finally armoured ranks. Each city in Cathay maintains its own standing army. These troops are well equipped by the wealth of their city with the finest weapons and armour. They carry banners bearing the symbol of their city, as well as the uh, dragon to which their city owes allegiance, all under the icon of the celestial dragon who rules all the Cathay. Given their place within the defence of the Empire, they are known as Jade Warriors, a stone sacred to the Dragon Emperor, and one that represents the implacable nature of his realm. So Jade in uh, Warhammer, it's, um, it's a stone that is associated with the Jade Wind of magic, Gyron. Um, so, you know, there are there is life magic that's sort of the heart of their, um, you know, the hierarchy, I guess, um, you know. So I, I think that's a fun thing, the fact that it's it's something that was already established in like Warhammer canon, and can now feed on like real life history, um, of, of Japan because medieval Japan jade was seen as as a material, um, you know that was sort of uh, uh, associated with the emperor basically, and that's the case in Cathay as well. So I think that's really cool, you know, especially because it's already got that that foundation within uh, within Warhammer, just by complete coincidence, but they're able to feed on that to make it just fit in the world better, you know, to make it fit in the world more, which I love. So, uh, yeah, so that'll do for them because we have lots more Jade Warriors to look at. We have Jade Warriors with halberds. So the living embodiment of Cathay's nigh impregnable Great Bastion, for few enemies can hope to breach their armoured line. Grand Cathay is a land in harmony with the world around it, with every soldier knowing their place in the grand designs of the Celestial Dragon Emperor. Known as the Harmony of Stone and Steel, uh, this perfect alignment of purpose and will expresses itself in the discipline of the armies of the dragons. Armed with pole arms, crossbows, and equipped with heavy armour and shields, Jade Warriors of the Bastion, upon which the enemy breaks, be they defending their city's walls or at the very centre of Cathayan battle line. And now Jade Warrior Crossbowmen. Though Cathayan crossbows are infallible, they are nothing without the discipline of the Jade Warriors who wield them. Despite its understanding of technology such as gunpowder, alchemy, and machinery, Cathay does not rely upon them in battle in the way the Empire and the Dwarfs do. Rather, their technological advances are merely another tool in, the vast, in their vast arsenal, and one that cannot be replaced, in the eyes of the Celestial Dragon at least, by the strength of conventional soldiers. Soldiers in the, uh, in the Cathayan armies fight in ordered ranks, each one trained to move in harmony with those around it, the entire army often fighting like a single organism under the direction of its generals. So, a few things here that I wonder. So, sticking with tradition, right, the Celestial Dragon Emperor, because obviously he had a plan for his empire of people, and then he's made them do it, and he wants them to keep to it, right? Um, however, we did mention um, uh, uh, Shan Yang, wasn't it? Shan Yang? Uh, do, 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 do. Hang on, so you're the one who said, yeah, Shang Yang is Shang Yang. Uh, you mentioned Shang Yang being a being a place of like industrial, you know, uh, merit, I suppose, um, and progress, which is interesting. When it's kind of like I don't know, it seems like the kids are are progressing, and yet the celestial dragon emperor himself is more traditional. So even though the technology behind things like his crossbows, they're infallible but they're still kind of old hat. But it also makes me wonder if part of that is because he doesn't want the people to be able to best him. Huh? You think maybe? Maybe he's just making sure that they're well-equipped enough, but not so well-equipped that they can pierce his armor, you know? Just just a thought, just a thought. That's not, you know, canon, it's just something to think about, 
you know, something to think about. Um, because I do wonder. So anyway, uh, next up. Hang on, nope. Order ranks, okay, yeah, fine. I think we read it all. If not, we got the gist. So, Jade Warrior, Crossbowman, Bracket, Shield. Uh, should the Dragon Emperor's foes survive the hail that greets their approach, they will be dashed against a near impregnable wall of shields. Armed with pole arms, crossbows, and equipped with heavy armour and shields, Jade Warriors are the bastion upon which the enemy breaks. Be they defending their city's walls or the centre of the Cathayan battle line, Cathayan soldiers make use of the great lacquered tower shields, either carried by gun teams or worn on the backs of warriors, so they might turn around and go down on one knee, creating a formidable defensive line. So I like this, actually. I like this a lot. It's um, it's not they're holding shields so they can just hold them in front of themselves to block, you know, when they're not shooting. It's just, no, they just turn around to reload, right? <laughs> so this just hints at the fact that the shields fit in better um, into, into their sort of discipline, you know, to their discipline, I guess, uh, which I like. Which I like that, you know? It's not like the uh, the dark shards that just hold a shield. It's just it's silly. It's just very silly. Anyway, this makes more sense. I love it. So next up, uh, we finally have Jade Lancers. These are the last of the Jade Warriors. A lot of Jade Warriors. There's five different, you know, sort of Jade Warrior units. So you could really field a lot of armies just involving them, which is really cool. So their thunderous charges are, a fierce, are as fearsome within cramped city streets as they are upon the plains of war. The heavy cavalry of Cathaya, the Jade Lancers, mounted soldiers of the great cities, the wealthiest cities, like Fu Chao or Wei Jin, which is the capital, can afford large contingents of Jade Lancers, though even the remote cities of the south and west can usually muster at least a unit of these troops. In addition to being a potent tool in the open field, Jade Lancers train to fight in the constricted streets of their cities, and are able to launch devastating charges through narrow alleyways, across bridges, and through the tunnels that pierce the city walls. Now this, I think, is very interesting, because why would you need to train in urban combat all that much? You have the Great Bastion, right? The idea is, is you're keeping the enemies out. So the idea of being drilled to fight people within your own walls, to me, it feels like it's, it's sort of um, mirroring the Empire, where state troops basically act as the police when there isn't a war on right and the idea of an entire sort of um uh, sort of organized military that represents its uh its ruler you know its emperor they're all wearing jade right there's no mistaking who they're working for uh them making sure that they're keeping the peace um is is an interesting one you know incredibly authoritarian but you know that's empires for you so I think it's really interesting. It's an interesting um, concept. I imagine there are far fewer free towns and uh, you know Freistats in uh, in in Cathay than there are in the Empire. You know, so I'm not sure merchants have quite the same sway in Cathay. So the idea of jade lancers keeping the peace, uh, yeah, a bit scary, a bit scary. But I can see it. I can totally see it. You know, we've seen the cities, all those high walls and and the, the rich living in the mountains above, you know, completely out of reach of the peasantry. It all it all fits, you know, aesthetically and practically it'll you know, it makes sense to me. So, next up, uh, we're gonna go over the next tier of infantry, Celestial Dragon Guard. So, the Dragon Emperor's personal bodyguard, the greatest of mortal warriors and a shining inspiration to all Cathay. The Celestial Dragon Guard are formidable soldiers, easily the equal to the best mortal troops of other realms. Supplementing their natural skill, they are given the best armor and weapons in the Empire, often carrying celestial blades and armor forged in the workshops of Kun Lan. Their presence on the battlefield almost guarantees victory for the Cathayans, and other troops in the army draw courage from the sight of the Dragon Emperor's personal troops. Now, Kun Lan. Kun Lan is a city in the game. And let's see if there's anything interesting about it. So, Kun Lan. So, uh... Kun Lan. Because I know, um... Because Kun Lan is something to do with... Uh... Um... Iron Fist, right? In Marvel. He's, he trained in Kun Lan. It's a mountain range. Certainly, but I want to see the mythological aspect of it. So, let's have a look. Here we go. So the Kanlan, simplified Chinese, okay, fine, pinyin, blah, blah, blah. Uh, 
or Kanlan Shan, is a mountain or mountain range in Chinese mythology, an important symbol representing the Axis Mundi and divinity. So, um... Cool. Okay, the mytholo uh, mythological Kanlan is based on various sources, mythologic and geographic, of the so-called Kanlan Mountains of the Tibetan Plateau and Mount Kailash. Which, I think Kailash might actually be the thing that inspired, um... Is it... Ka Carlos? Ka Kalos? Is it? The, the Klingon uh, saint. <laughs> that could be what inspired that, too. Uh, I, lo I love when random cultural bits are used in, in stuff like this. So anyway, as uh, archetypal uh, Omphalos. Oh, of course. Of course. One of those archetypal Omphaloses. Yeah. All right. Come on. Let's go down the rabbit hole. What are you? What are you? Religious stone artifact. Okay. In ancient Greek. Okay. It means navel, apparently. Okay. It's an archetypical navel. <laughs> anyway. So... Tam Khan land has also been used, uh, has also been applied to southeast, uh, southeastern Asian lands or islands, and seemingly even Africa, although the relationship to the mountains is not clear beyond the nomenclature. In any case, Kanlan refers to distant, exotic, and mysterious places. Different locations of Kanlan have been ascribed in the various legends, myths, and semi-historical accounts in which it appears. These accounts typically describe Kanlan as the dwelling place of various gods and goddesses, where fabled plants and mythical creatures may also be found. So there's no real mystery as to why this is where the, the mystical, you know, weapons are forged. I'm assuming this is this is Chinese's version of Mount Olympus, you know? Um, that's what this is. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of little interesting tidbits in here, but I think we get the idea, right? A mystical, you know, mountain kingdom, you know, where the gods reside. So probably a holiday home for the celestial dragon, right? Anyway, so cool stuff. Uh, also, there's a there's a gold mine in uh, Kandalan in um, uh, 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 this game, <laughs> right? You can you can go there. It's it's up by Weijin, so you can go find it. Uh, right. So uh, next up, the other celestial dragon unit. We have the celestial dragon crossbowman. So only the Celestial Host enjoy the greatest armaments of the Dragon Empire, for only they can guarantee victory upon the field of battle. It makes sense, they're the best of the best of the best, and Cathay still exists, so clearly they haven't lost yet. Uh, the Celestial Dragon Guard are the personal bodyguard of the Dragon Emperor and Empress, and form the Celestial Host, the greatest soldiers in all Cathay. As the most elite warriors in the Empire, they enjoy the finest weapons and armour, and are almost always led by a member of the Dragon-Blooded. The dragon crossbows of the Celestial High Guard are the uh, work of Grant Cathay's master weaponsmiths. They are massive repeating weapons, able to lay down a steady stream of heavy bolts. Which, yeah, absolutely. Big armor-piercing damage on these guys. Really nice. Really nice. Shots per volley, a couple, 12 damage each. They do a lot of work. Do a lot of work indeed. I really like these guys. As well, 160 range is good range. Uh, if you look at the Peasant Bowman, Peasant Bowman only have 140. These guys are really good. I mean, we saw them in action, you know, in the, the campaign preview, which I'm assuming you guys have looked at, or else why are you here? This is the boring video, where it's just me talking. Yeah. We're very boring around here. <laughs> I'm proud of it, okay? I'm an old man. So anyway, uh, so we got that out of the way. One more, one more unit of, uh, of that order. Uh, the Great Longmar Riders. The Riders of the Celestial Host are the elite of the elite. The Dragon Emperor trusts only his own kin more than they. The Celestial Dragon Guard are formidable soldiers, easily the equal to the best mortal troops of other realms. Supplementing their, pardon me, their natural skill, they are given the best equipment in the Cathayan Empire, often carrying celestial blades and armor forged in the workshops of Kunlan. Their presence on the battlefield almost guarantees victory for the Cathayans, and other troops in the army draw courage from the sight of their Dragon Emperor's personal troops. Almost without exception, the Longmar cavalry of the Celestial Host consist of the Dragon-Blooded. So these are all Dragon-Blooded, so that extra power that they have just innately is um, obviously incredibly useful, but they're still, you know, in a subservient role to the, um, to the, to the dragons, right? They're, these are just cavalry. They're not running things, which I think is really interesting. Um, I think it's really interesting indeed. I don't think the dragon-blooded are seen with 
uh, a great degree of reverence by their parents or grandparents, aunties and uncles. I really don't think so. I think they're just a bunch of bastards. And I mean that in the literal sense, I'm not just being mean. <laughs> but yeah, they just have innate power because they are related to the dragon, so they have innate power, but I don't think they're respected in that way. Maybe revered by, and feared by mortals, but um, yeah, it doesn't seem that there's like nepotism giving them positions of power, and we know nepotism is all there really is. All the dragons are in charge and everyone else is beneath them, and it really does seem to be everyone else is beneath them. So um, it seems that they're in the, the greatest order, you know, of cavalry, simply because they have innate strength, because of the dragon blood, not because, you know, not because it's like, oh, your family, we'll get you a nice thing. I don't think that's the case. So I wonder, I do wonder. Um, but we'll go back and talk about how horrific it, the, the dragon-blooded their situation is because it's really horrible when you think about it too much but anyway we'll get to that um so anyway uh almost without exception the longmark cavalry of the celestial host consist of the dragon blooded swifter than normal horses and able to spear their foes on their horns great longmar are the ultimate shock horse soldiers anywhere in the world so uh it's my understanding that long means dragon and ma means horse literally just dragon horse um which is fun <laughs> Gold dragon horses. Uh, so yeah, great longmar riders. Uh, very cool indeed. Um, you know, what? let's go back to it now. So, so the dragon blooded, right? So the dragon blooded. The dragon blooded Shugangan. The dragon blooded. So they're the kids of dragons, uh, but it's dragons who have hooked up with mortals. But the mortals, as we discovered from the all the backstory concerning um, how you know Jalmin has a drink with people, therefore everyone thinks he's lost his mind. It's basically like, you know, seeing them as equal. It, clearly mortals, you know, mortal men are seen as, as nothing, right? They're not seen with that in, in high enough regard to share a drink with, um, which sadly is the same kind of relationship between so like slave owner and slave. And we know that resulted in a lot of children that were equally as dismissed, um, which is pretty grim. Um, or, because technically they're different species, though species means that they shouldn't be able to breed, but magic, so okay, fine. And, you know, this happened with, like, Zeus and stuff, you know, it's, it's mythology and folklore tying stuff together, so whatever, you know. But, but yeah, it's, it's, either, it's either a slave or a pet. Like, pick one. It's pretty grim, regardless, and just as a, a way to lighten the mood a bit after that horrific, you know, idea that you have to be mad to hang out with a, with a, to share a drink with a human. Oh, oh, having your way with them is fine, though. It's messed up, okay? Just flat out, it's messed up. Um, but to turn this on its head a bit, does that mean the dragon horses came from a similar, <laughs> a similar relationship? Is that, is that how that happened? Did did one of them have a late night visit to the stables? I mean, I'm just I'm just asking questions, guys. I'm just asking questions. So anyway, um, I, please do try and I mean I know, okay, sensitive topics and also quite silly, you know, going to quite a silly topic there. But if everyone could try and be fairly mature in the comments, uh, that would be very appreciated. If I think anyone's crossed the line, you're getting banned. So, like, you know, be academic about this, please. Or I am going to ban you because I'm not having people make light of of this stuff. It's a it's an interesting thing to talk about intellectually, but let's keep it, yeah, good. Because I will ban you. No problem with doing that. Good. Um, same goes for if I ever do a Slanesh campaign. I will ban all of you. Totally fine with that. Good. Let's let's be mature. Remember, I'm an old man. Luckily, I think most of the kids stopped watching half an hour ago, so we're probably fine. Anyway, so next up we have. Ooh, what should I go next? Uh, let's look at the guns. We're gonna go look at the guns. So we'll start with the iron hail gunners. I love these. You've obviously seen them in the preview. Um, I think they're so fun. And actually, this little description really just reinforces everything I said about them. And also what someone said in the comments as well. There's someone who's going to be very smug uh, watching this. I go, oh, I said that. Um, you did. You did. So, 
Uh, Iron Hail Gannos. Should Cathay's enemies dare approach, Iron Hail volleys can shred steel plate as if it were rice paper. And it really can. Like, big armor-piercing damage. These things are crazy. I absolutely adore them. So three projectiles at a time, 11 armor-piercing damage each. And when all of them, I mean, it's 90 in a unit, when 90 of them just blast a unit or something. Um, oh, it's devastating. It's so good, provided you can actually get them in range. They don't have much range. And also, missile fire will murder them. But anyway, so the Iron Hail Gunner, uh, sorry, the Iron Hail Gun is a heavy blunderbuss with a large bore for close-in work. Though short-ranged, it is ideally suited to, def to defence, either in the close confines of a city or from the battlements of the Great Bastion. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? Get them lined up, you know, block an entrance, block a street, let the enemy walk into them, and they'll all be dead very quickly. Um, very powerful units. Love them. So... Cathayan commanders often deploy their iron hail gunners on the flanks of their formations where they can discourage even heavily armoured horsemen. You in the comments, time to be smug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the game says, put them on the flanks. And, um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I can't remember exactly what I said to you. I think I was more emphasising the fact that, yeah, having a couple on the flanks is good, but having, like, loads of them defending a siege or, you know, blocking off streets is, is way better. Um, so, you know have more than two yeah because they're really fun uh so anyway the concentrated shots from the iron uh hail guns able to punch through shields and plate at close range um and honestly like in i think in multiplayer they might find a niche um against certain factions that are lacking a lot of range support um just the fact that it, you can just negate anything like expensive heavy cavalry charging down a flank can't risk it one volley from these guys and they paid for themselves they hit so hard you know and with that armor piercing it doesn't matter if it's like an elite heavily armored unit they're gonna die so it's really good they're a really good units it's just a shame about that range you know if the enemy has any archers they're just gonna die so you know win some lose some next up crane gunners these might help deal with the archers before they can kill the Iron Hell Gunners, though they've probably got better uses, to be fair. So the Crane Guns. Only the, the hardiest of souls can survive the elegant volleys of Nun Gao's devastatingly precise artillery. So Nun Gao is actually where um, uh, Miao Yin starts, as you've seen, and they have a forge, you know? Um, they are big on artillery, because they're, they're the ones producing all the artillery and guns for the uh, Great Bastion. So that, again, it feels like a lot of progress towards something in a faction that's sort of trying to force tradition by going oh the elite of the elite have a crossbow which seems weird right so you see what i mean i think i don't know if it's like the kids have pushed things forward and you know the celestial dragon emperor is still going no 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 no. it's got to be got to be better than that but he's asleep right now and he's, he's letting his kids look after stuff so is he going to wake up someday and be livid like what are you doing what are you doing giving humans these tools it's absurd how dare you um, but of course, it could just be a case of keeping up with the neighbours, right? You know, Chaos are going to get all kinds of ridiculous cannons and things, um, taking inspiration from, you know, the likes of mortal, you know, sort of dwarfs and, and men of the Empire. So you've got to keep pace with it, right? So, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe. One day. Who knows? I'm hoping there'll be a bunch of literature around Cathay at some point. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Anyway. So, uh, one of the most common variants is the Crane Gun. Oh, no, I went too far. The foundries of the City of Smoke. No, I haven't read that at all. Firearms are primarily... There we go. It's the top of the paragraph. I only read the little blurb. I read the little blurb and got sidetracked again. So, firearms are primarily constructed in Nangao by the by Edict of the Dragon Emperor. Okay. Ignore everything I said, because the Dragon Emperor wants the guns. It's very strange. Very strange. Anyway, the foundries of the City of Smoke turn out large numbers of these weapons in all shapes and sizes. One of the most common variants is the crane gun, a long-barreled firearm often carried by two Nangao soldiers and fixed to a tower shield for greater accuracy. Used in large numbers, these guns can scythe down enemy formations at great distances or pick off enemy leaders and monsters with precise volleys of fire. Too right. So these are like Warplong Gisales, you know, really huge range at 275, and uh, they got good damaging and uh, shield breaker. So they can they can stop shields working so well, which is great. I think they're really interesting units for sure. I haven't used them much yet though. I haven't used them that much. I've used a few, in a couple of survival battles, but uh, yeah, I haven't used them a lot. But I do like them. I just like getting up in people's grill a lot more, which is a shame. 
because standing about with a bunch of crane guns does sound like a lot of fun. But anyway, that's them. Next up, we have some artillery. So we're going to go with the Grand Cannon. Wrought in the sacred form of fire-belching dragon mouths, their flaming cannibals could topple almost any foe. So this obviously gunpowder in reverence to dragons, so, you know, it's very obvious uh, that it's a sort of tribute, this one. Uh, the armies of Cathay use many kinds of cannon in their armies, most forged in the workshops of Nangao. These include massive grand cannons shaped like roaring dragons, each, able, uh, each one able to belch fire or spit flaming cannonballs. The walls of the Great Bastion are lined with such war machines, the fortress towers of the wall looking like war galleons, with sides bristling with uh, row upon row of cannon. When the armies of Grand Cathay march to war, some of these great guns are set upon oxen hauled gun carriages, where they can lend their impressive firepower to the Dragon Emperor's soldiers. Very cool. Really like, uh, really like the Grand Cannons. Uh, basically like a uh, flame, a mixture of like something between flame cannons and the Empire's great cannons. So like better range, but fire, f like flaming cannonballs and slightly lower firing arc. They're good. I like them. And uh, fire rain rockets. They're just Hellstorm rocket batteries, but you know, dragony. Uh, so the swiftly propagating flames of fire rain rockets more than make up for their undepe uh, undependable accuracy. They don't need to be accurate. It's actually good that they're not, because that way they hit a spread of units, rather than all just, you know, all the rockets landing in the same spot. So, rocket launchers are used extensively in the armies of Grand Cathay. Inaccurate but deadly, they haul explosive explosives long distances, usually in great numbers, to saturate an entire area in flame and shrapnel but are equally able to deliver single massive rockets against monsters or fortifications. The Fire Rain Rocket Battery is a portable war machine, drawn by oxen and crewed by soldiers of Nangao. From its snarling dragon mouth, it fires either a hail of incendiary rockets to set a section of battlefield alight, or a larger lone explosive, able to blast a hole in enemy fort uh, formations. Really cool stuff. I do love the artillery. Um, okay, now, a bit more sophisticated. We look at the Sky Lantern. So, Sky Lantern, uh, a floating symbol of Cathay's preeminence, powered by the burning wings of magical warbirds. So, magical warbirds, I I want to see these because are they related to phoenixes? Are they phoenixes? Like, what's the deal? What's the deal with these? I want to know more. I really want to know more. Please give a standalone units of those, please. In, how cool would that be for DLC? Just like a flock of, of flaming birds. Um, I think it'd be really fun. You know, like Chaos Furies, but they're like little phoenixes. They'd be really cute and terrifying because they're on fire. So Sky Lanterns are used by the Dragon Emperor's armies to observe enemies from on high, as well as direct troops in battle, held aloft by a caged vermilion warbird. Whatever that is. Um... You know what? I'm gonna quickly I'm gonna quickly look it up. Hang on. Vermilion Warbird. I feel like I did try and Google this at one point already. Um uh, the So the Vermilion Bird or uh Juku something uh, is one of the four symbols of the Chinese constellations. According to Wu Xing, the Taoist five elemental system also a compass, <laughs> it represents the fire element. Uh, so, yeah, okay. So I guess it's just, they have expanded upon, uh, they have expanded upon the the concept of, of that, I guess. Hmm. See, so, yeah, hard to know. So, uh, Fu Hong. Let's have a look at Fu Hong. Uh, on the Warhammer wiki. So, uh, Fu Hong, also known as the Chanting City, is the capital city of the southern provinces of Grand Cathay, which are ruled by uh, Li Dao, the Fire Dragon. Fu Hong is located in the far south of Cathay, near the Mountains of Heaven, and is the capital of the southern provinces. It contains the Phoenix Temple, a grand structure shaped like a vermilion warbird. The city is home to Chanting Monks, which is presumably where it came the moniker, the Chanting City. Um... So that was literally from, from Andy Hall, uh, this round table. So, interesting. Interesting. So he did cover that. I don't remember him covering that. I really don't. Uh, but hey, there we go. We've got information on it now. So it is like a phoenix. It's the Phoenix Temple. 
and the Vermilion Warbird. Are they the same? Is it a loose relative? What's the... I have no idea, but anyway. Let's crack on. So, uh, in fact, that round table, I, I think I asked that question then. I think I was the one that actually submitted that question. <laughs> I never... Uh, who knows? Um, yeah, I don't know how I've forgotten that. But hey, phoenixes. Kinda. Now we know. So, next up. Uh, oh, hang on. We haven't read all this yet. Um, so, Sky Lanterns are used by the Dragon Emperor's armies to observe enemies from on high, as well as troops of battle, cage from Billion Warbird, the creature's burning wings giving the great balloon lift. A Sky Lantern holds an armoured gondolier beneath its bulk. From this gondolier, one of the Lord Magistrate's best strategists use fans and banners to signal troops or direct the fire of the army's war machines. Should enemy flyers or missile troops get too close, a pair of crane gunners snipe from their exceptional vantage point. So the Sky Lantern is actually a mount option for the Lord Magistrate. So, um, makes sense. You know, it's where he orchestrates things from on high. So there's a couple of cool abilities here. Uh, so, uh, here we go. Eye of the Dragon. Forest spotting. So, if you're stuck near a bunch of forests, you can just have the Sky Lantern hang out by the forest and you'll be able to see everything in it really well, which I think is just a really unique ability, but um, you know, such an interesting one if you're going to turtle, because that's sort of the biggest enemy of turtling up like that, with a bunch of like long range guns, is people can just hide in forests and things, so I think that's really fun that's a really nice addition um, also, also, yin, of course because, you know, it's a ranged one so, next up we have the sky junk so, a flame-born airship as immense as any seafaring craft capable of laying waste to entire regions uh, an, in, uh, an invention of Shi Hong, Nan Gao's master war artificer. The Sky Junk is a wonder of the Celestial Army, as large as a ship of the Jade Fleet, which is their navy. I wish we got to see some of that. Uh, it is suspended in the air by a series of Sky Lanterns, its armoured cradle able to turn aside arrows and bullets as its crew rain death down upon the enemies of the Empire. Marvellous. These great vessels can be seen defending the borders of Grand Cathay, but are also used beyond the Great Bastion, where armadas of the Dragon Emperor's sky ships have lain waste to entire marauder tribes. A brilliant invention. Just so good for the Warhammer world. Because, I mean, a bunch of marauders running around swinging axes about? Just blow them up from the sky. Like, it's such a great way just to, just to you know, root out evil like that. Any marauders start to gather nearby the Great Bastion, just send out send out the Air Force, bomb them into oblivion, that'll stop them. Um, but it makes perfect sense, you know? You don't want to touch anything in the Chaos Waste. You don't want to traipse through it. You could fall through, you know, you could fall through obsidian into molten lava at the drop of a hat, you know? Or a tentacle could grab you and throw you into a big mouth. You know? Chaos Waste are rubbish. <laughs> Horrible place for a picnic. So yeah, just fly around. Fly around a big, a big sky junk covered in guns and bombs. Brilliant. Brilliant. These guys know what they're doing. So, uh, next up, we have, uh, we have, okay, we have two more units left. We have two more. So, first one, Terracotta Sentinel. Obviously based on the Terracotta Warriors. You know, the, the, the burial site. Is it a burial site? Was that decided? You know what? We're going to Google it. We're going to Google it. I say Google it. I actually use Ecosia which is uh, sadly powered by Bing, which can sometimes be lacking. But uh, they plant trees with the ad revenue, which is quite sweet. So, uh, you know, that way I get to feel good about myself with all the electricity I use for my job. So, uh, what was I going to look up again? Oh, yes. Uh, Terra Cotta Warriors. Let's have a look. So, do 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 Where are you? I mean, just give it to me on Wikipedia. Like, I don't need to... Like, it doesn't need to be fancy. Okay, good. So here we go. That... Nope, that's... Why? <laughs> why Why wouldn't it be in English? That's very weird. Why aren't you in English all of a sudden? I think it's because I spelt terracotta wrong. Like, really, really wrong. Okay, come on now. Uh, here we go. No, once again, it's it's in Polish. 
There's just, there's just no one English made a. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, it just wants me to be on the Polish site, but it's okay. Google can translate. So the Terracotta Army, uh, obviously Chinese. Um, uh, a collection of approximately life-size figures made of terracotta, made clay, depicting soldiers, officers, and horses found in the tomb of the Chinese first Qin emperor. So there you go. It's the burial site of an emperor, uh, which makes a lot of sense, given the fact that it's the emperor that created the terracotta sentinels, because he can't die. So, you know, it gives it gives an emperor a connection with terracotta warriors, right? You know, the terracotta army. So it allows that connection um, in a Warhammer way. So there you go. So... Let's get back to it. So, Terracotta Sentinels. The fearless stone giants stand guard across the length and breadth of the Celestial Empire, awaiting the Dragon Emperor's call. Terracotta Sentinels are creations born of the Dragon's mastery of the elemental winds, each one a towering animated statue fashioned in the form of a great warrior. Legend has it that these Sentinels are the gigantic soldiers of an army built by the Dragon Emperor thousands of years ago when chaos threatened to overwhelm the Empire. Since then, they have been left scattered across Cathay, waiting to be called to war once more. Once given orders, a terracotta sentinel will not falter in its duty, relentless carrying out rel relentlessly or anyway, relentless carrying out its last commands until the task is complete. So I do wonder quite why they're just sat around. There's still a lot of chaos to be dealt with. Um, although I guess in a when you're fighting a foe that exists in a realm beyond time and space, um, then, I don't know, are you really doing a lot of good? You can't really chase them in there. I don't know, it's an odd one. It's a bit of an odd one. But uh, I do wonder. I mean, obviously, it'd be a bit overpowered if just these were getting spat out left, right and centre by some mighty forge um, and being sent to war repeatedly for you. I think it makes sense. They're sort of in a limited quantity and, um, and you know, aren't particularly active. Uh, right now. Also, I think they're definitely um, just having them dotted around Cathay. I think it kind of reminds the people who's in charge quite a lot. Because um, that's what, it's basically what statues are for, you know? It's basically what they do, is to, to tell people who to revere. It's what they're for. So, Terracotta Sentinels are just giant statues going, hey, remember the Dragon Emperor? <laughs> remember who, who, who runs this place? Yeah. Um... So, you know, I think I think they're interesting, but I, I do wonder if it's literally just down to the fact that Winds of Magic aren't, uh, you know, as fierce now as they once were. Because they were built at a time before the Vortex would have been active. Because they're there to defend Cathay from the demon incursion, right? When the gates fell, they had to fight back. This is how they fought back. So is it just the fact that they... Is, like, uh, is it kind of like they're solar-powered, but it's cloudy? <laughs> Is that it? Because I think it could be. I genuinely think it could be that. Um, so I'd love to know more about them, how they function and, and what their limitations are, why they're just sat idle, or if it's literally just the, the Celestial Dragon Emperor is asleep and, you know, his his mind can only sort of um, call out and, and give orders to them when he's awake or, you know, in limited amounts when he's asleep. Just something like that. I'd, I'd love to know. I'd love to know. If you guys have any, you know, information on these guys that uh, could shed light on that or you know any context that I've I've you know ignored or whatever uh, then yeah let me know I'd, I'd be really interested because I think they're a super intriguing unit I think they're very cool and then finally the Uxing war compass this mighty war compass can harness the elements themselves the idea of a mighty compass is very bizarre it's a very weird statement to make so anyway, this mighty war campus can harness the elements themselves, for even wind and lightning serve the Dragon Emperor's will. Which again is pretty impressive, just say, no, 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 he is above the elements <laughs> in the hierarchy, you know, uh, I think that's amazing. In the, in the universal hierarchy, it goes dragon, wind and lightning. Humans are, I can't put my arm low enough, just, it's down there somewhere in the, in the comment section. <laughs> So, the Wuxing, know your place. The Wuxing Compass is a smaller version of the Great Compass of Wei Jin, being their capital and where the Celestial um, uh, uh, Emperor and uh, Moon Empress uh, reside. 
So crafted to resonate with the elemental winds, it helps the wizards of Grand Cathay control and direct the winds of magic, strengthening or weakening them for the benefit of their armies. Mounted on a specially designed chariot platform, the compass is drawn into battle alongside the Celestial Dragon's armies, a court scribe of the Celestial Court tending to its intricate mechanisms. Properly manipulated, the Yuxing Compass can unleash the elemental wind of Azir. Assailing the enemies of Cathay with lightning bolts, storm winds, or even a devastating rain of meteors. So the winds, uh, you think wind blast, right? No. No, it only has two spells. I think maybe they planned that it would have three, <laughs> and then didn't. Uh, or maybe, or maybe it has, you know, full control of Azir, and it's just for gameplay reasons, you just get a couple of choice spells. But you get a Celestial Comet, which of course, Comet Cassandora, and you get Celestial Lightning, which is uh, Oradon's Thunderbolt. But of course, Comet Cassandora and uh, and and um, Oradon's Thunderbolt, they're named after uh, Western wizards, aren't they? All the spells are named after their creators, um, but something generic like a Lightning Bolt, or, you know, whatever. No, 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 it's the, the Celestial Dragon Emperor is getting credit, actually. He's the one that taught everyone how to use his ear, so they're called Celestial whatever, okay? That's how that's going. So, you better watch it. Watch what you say. Cassandora, who the hell's that? Stupid, that's who. They're stupid. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, cool. That's all of them. That's all of them. But what thing uh, about the compass, which I find really interesting, um... I just, I love the idea of it, because it's basically their take on the Celestial Huracanum, uh, which we don't have yet. It's not in the Empire roster yet. Um, so, Cathay beat us to it. I know. Oh. I'm always rooting for the Empire. So, uh, yeah, Wuxian Compass. It's like the Celestial Huracanum. It can control the Winds of Azir. And I've got to say, I, I was originally, because it looks like it's covered in jade, I thought it would be harnessing Gaidron. Um, you know, the life magic at first. I'm actually quite surprised it's, it's um, you know, Azir, you know, the wind of heavens that it's that it's harnessing. But it does make sense with the whole, like, astromancy being like, like a core um, sort of, um, I don't know, like a core tenet of Cathayan bluff, <laughs> right? So, I don't know. I think it's cool. I think it's a cool unit. But also, one thing that's really interesting is it has mastery of the elemental winds. So much like all other wizards, this will contribute to how good spellcasters are. So it has a couple of bound spells, but it also can boost other people's spells because it is literally harnessing, you know, magic and bring, drawing more magic towards people. It's allowing wizards to use that magic more effectively. So I think it's really cool. I think it's a really interesting unit, um, which again, I haven't really had the chance to use a whole lot yet, um, but they seem interesting for sure. It's just the concept is cool. I really like it. So I think that's everybody. I don't think we missed anybody. I think that's everybody. That only took us um, uh, eight million years? Yes, yes, eight million years uh, we've been doing this. So <laughs> over an hour. Anyway, um, it's been fun, though. It's been fun. And it's a bit better than having to stop and start a bunch of campaigns that we're never going to really finish. So I think burning some time just chatting about the unit, um, especially when they're brand new, like they, I'll probably do this for uh, Kislev as well, potentially, though I might just dive into starting a campaign then because it won't be long after that that we'll have a chance to do more. Uh, that will be like an unlimited um, thing at that point. So I might not have time, but I might do it a week late. I might do it when I have, when I can post as much as I want. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, also, arguably, I could have just um, taken a few screenshots and taken no time at all. So maybe the guys at CA will be kind. Hi, be kind to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to timestamp this and send it to you. Yeah, love you, Josh. I've barely done any footage. This is barely anything. It shouldn't count. Thanks. <laughs> Sign the change.org petition down below, everybody. Um, that doesn't exist, and no one start that. Don't waste anyone's time. Um, but anyway, guys, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, comment, like, subscribe, hit the bell, obviously, um, so you can be notified when I'm doing proper content. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, remember, if you're looking to buy the game, there are affiliate links below, which really help the channel out just tremendously. Okay, tremendously. To put it into perspective, I earn about ten dollars from um, uh, like a like a, a late. Uh, campaign video right if it's like episode 20 and onwards i'm getting like a, a tenner for a video uh whereas if you guys buy warhammer 3 from me i'm getting ten dollars just from that so it's the same as the same as a video in like the sleepy months between content releases so like that helps a lot 
you know? That helps a hell of a lot. So bear it in mind. Uh, you can use Nexus or those affiliate links. Uh, they both help either way, and I appreciate it either way. So uh, love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Whatever the hell that's going to be. Bye.